the last item of cosmetics I'm going to attempt to make will be eye makeup, specifically eyeliner and eyeshadow. Dating back at least as far as the ancient Egyptians, both eyeshadow and eyeliner, known as kol, were popular with the elites of Egyptian society. Kohl eyeliner has a distinction of not only having cosmetic use, but also a functional one, as it's believed to provide protection from the sun. This has caused eyeliner to historically been popular with both men and women. A similar notion of protecting your eyes from the glare is used in eye black by athletes. Johnny Depp's choice of eyeliner as a pirate likely traces to this functional use of coal, which could possibly give a pirate an advantage at sea or in battle. But before I begin, I'll hand off to Brian for some info on the sponsor of today's video. Thanks to War Robots for sponsoring us. So we talked with the group behind War Robots a couple months ago about sponsorships, but at that time we didn't know anything about the game. So since then I've been playing it and I really think it's a fun game to play. This is a well thought out 6 vs 6 multiplayer game with quick loading, great 3D graphics, and a huge variety of robots with different skill sets and weapon options. Plus, you can skin your robots with different types of war paint to make them unique and more intimidating. Here's some of my own gameplay, and as you can see, there is a lot of action and a lot of explosions. To try it yourself, download War Robots via the link below and get a massive bonus of GI Patton Robot, a unique skin for it, plus four Punisher machine guns, 100 gold, and 400,000 silver just for signing up. To get things started, Caroline demonstrated for me the very simple way the coal can be produced. And there's a lot of recipes out there for coal, mm -hmm. and some of them have spiritual or even medicinal properties to them. But basically what it comes down to is a really simple scientific principle, and they're all kind of the same. It's like lighting a candle, this is a combustion. And so what's happening here, paraffin wax is traveling up the wick at a certain rate, and then the oxygen in the air is enough to create a complete combustion. But what happens if I reduce the amount of, of air that can go into this reaction, I create an incomplete combustion and I create completely different products. I'm going to create carbon monoxide, water, and something called carbon. Carbon is the secret to all of those old cosmetics with coal and kajal. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm just decreasing the amount of oxygen that can react with the paraffin that's coming up the wick. And there's some more carbon. And then we'll take this off the spoon here. So what we've created is just a tiny little bit of powder here mm -hmm. that's almost pure carbon. So how do we make this powder into something that would make an eyeliner or some kind of cosmetic? Well, yeah. we'll take some oil, mix it together into a consistency that we like. And if you hold your hand out, we now have eyeliner. Oh, wow. That's it? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's the principle this behind is, it. This is the basic science behind it. So this is... This is carbon this. black is what that's called. Carbon black is still used in mascara right now? It still is, yeah. Oh wow, cool. Thanks to Caroline's demonstration, I now know I'll need something to burn to produce a soot. At this point, I've produced a few different vegetable oils, but I want to try a new one that was commonly used as a fuel for lamps in Europe for many years. The unfortunately named rape or rapeseed plant. The name of this plant actually derives from the Latin word for turnip, rapum, and is most commonly known for the canola oil that can be derived from it. This summer, it grew these rather pretty little flowers that eventually developed into long pods filled with seeds. Once mature and dried, I harvested them and removed all the seeds. Then I ran it through my oil press and slowly extracted my oil. If I wanted to make a true canola oil, there's actually an extra step of reducing the erucic acid, which makes it unhealthy to consume. But I'm not planning on eating my cosmetics, so that hopefully shouldn't be necessary. Now that I have the oil, I just need to construct a makeshift lamp. For a wick, I used some of the scrap cotton I traveled to Texas to harvest. And then spun and wove when I made my suit from scratch. Sticking the end of it in the oil, I can light the other end, and it'll slowly soak up the oil as it burns it, all while producing the soot I'm after. I set a metal pie tin over the flame and let it burn. Then I can collect the accumulated soot and repeat the process over and over again until I have enough. Then it's just a matter of combining the collected soot with some oil to produce a pretty effective eyeliner.
At this point, I've made a few different colors from red, yellow, brown, black, white. But now I want to try and make one of the rarest colors, blue, specifically ultramarine. It's called ultramarine because it comes from a rock that was sourced across the sea, specifically Afghanistan. So I have one of these rocks right here that has trace amounts of lapis lunalis. Lapis lazuli. Lapis la lazuli. Lapis lazuli. These are found mostly in Afghanistan and a few other areas in the world. Instead of using this natural mineral, I'm gonna try and recreate it synthetically. Because it was rarity and isolated source, it was a pretty expensive dye. I think it was most, one of the most expensive for a while. So in the 1800s, there was a big demand to find a synthetic way to replicate it. And the way they ended up finding involved a lot of leftover chemicals from glass making, which having spent basically the whole year making glass, I have a lot of those leftover materials. So I'm gonna put them all together and I'm gonna to attempt to synthetically recreate ultramarine. Generally so far, I've tried to be mostly natural ingredients. This will be the first attempt at making something synthetic. So we'll see how that goes. When I traveled to Utah this summer to collect ingredients for glass making, I also ended up getting almost all the ingredients I need for ultramarine. The first ingredient is a sodium carbonate that I collected from the lake in Wyoming. Cody helped me separate it from the other impurities in the lake. But that impurity, primarily sodium sulfate to be exact, is actually another ingredient I'll need. According to the original geographic study I used to find the sodium carbonate in the first place, the salts in the shore of the lake should contain a larger portion of sodium sulfate. So I collected some of that salt while I was there too. Since I'll be using both chemicals, there's no real need to separate them, but I will want to purify them, as they currently smell disgusting. It is disgusting here. There's like swarms of flies over there. It just smells disgusting. I'm not sure where it is. I don't know if it's actual chemicals. I mean, the water looks disgusting. It's super cloudy. It's probably the high concentration of the chemicals, but there might be other stuff in here too. Hopefully not. I'm trying to get pure stuff. Definitely salt in there. A lot of salt. Smells disgusting. So we dissolve the compounds in water. Strain out the debris. Then left them to recrystallize into a much less disgusting, fairly pure white powder. The next item I'll need is a fine clay, which I just happened to be able to collect while I was at the Redmond Salt Mine. Lastly, I'll need sulfur. Also while in Utah, we were able to collaborate with an expert gold panner, which will be featured in a future episode. The gold panner gave us a tour of some of the mines in the area and shared with us this huge hunk of fool's gold he had found in one of his mines. From this chunk of iron pyrite, I can roast it and cause it to decompose into its two elements it's made of, iron and sulfur. First, I attempted it using the forge. That was a little too intense and left me with only the iron left over. Made iron. Next, I tried a smaller scale test tube. I was able to produce some sulfur powder from that. Any iron that was left over, I could remove with a magnet. Probably not the most efficient method to produce sulfur, but at least in this case, it seems to have worked. With these key ingredients, I can now combine them and attempt the ultramarine reaction. Through my research, I found several different recipes using different proportions and temperatures, as well as some additional ingredients like charcoal or pine resin. Over the course of several months, I would try out pretty much every combination I could, all while slowly buying more and more equipment. The biggest challenge is that the process requires the mixture to be heated and held at a high temperature for anywhere from four to 48 hours, depending on which recipe you're following. The forge I had previously built can easily reach these high temperatures, but it's hard to measure the exact internal temperature of the mix and hold at that constant temp. 
Next, I tried small crucibles over a Bunsen burner. This had two problems. First, it was difficult to get the inside of the crucible hot enough for the long duration on just a Bunsen burner. And secondly, the crucibles weren't airtight and the sulfur inside would react with the outside air and burn off before it could react with the other compounds in the mix. It's oozing now. What? Stuck. Only 450. It's not really hot enough. Ha! Ah! Jesus. All right, left this guy running overnight. What are the odds? What are the odds it actually worked? That's good. Oh, That's some blue maybe. Can you see it? It's pretty invisible. Inside, you can see just a hint of blue. Next, I tried just using a test tube, which ended up being a little bit easier to heat to the right temperature range. However, they aren't meant for operating at such high heat for so long, and kept shattering towards the end of the process. Oh, that's sulfur. Oh. Too much pressure. Whew. Side just blew out of it. After I turned it off, it's purple though. That's interesting. That off. Oh, for burning. For some reason, it's burning purple though. I need better test tubes. At this point, I was ready to give up, but I noticed these little specks of blue ultramarine on the shattered glass, meaning I'm actually on the right track. Hopefully, this next batch. We'll have a higher yield. Maybe this time it won't explode. More or less three hours. So I'm going to try this out. I'm going to switch to the crucible so it can be oxidized, exposed to air. And it's burning. More red than anything. It's burning. I feel like it's not the best sign. I'm gonna call it. I don't think this worked. Shut her down. Oh. That's not good. After several more failed attempts using a test tube, I finally broke down and bought a small kiln which could set and hold the high temperature at the mere press of a button. With this new equipment, finally success. Or it should have been, if the brand new kiln hadn't burned itself out halfway through the bake. Over even a little short on the full bake time, I was able to yield some much larger chunks so of ultramarine, which I think I can fish out and combine together with all the other attempts and have just enough while I wait for the warranty repair on the kiln. Okay, so it took about, I don't even know, 12, 15 tries, but uh, after failures of the glass making, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to actually solve this before I moved on and uh, basically did. Um, some of the latter attempts actually started to finally get some sizable chunks of color. So I was able to combine everything we got and get a pretty decent eyeshadow right here. Pretty close, I think. So that was a lot of work. I had to buy a special kiln. The good news is we have this kiln now. It'll probably help for making glass in the future. So, got this, got the uh, coal I made earlier. So I think we started this in September, it's December now. I started in a t-shirt, I am now wearing a coat and everything is covered in snow outside. Can't even see my breath. But in the end, I did succeed at finally making some ultramarine for the eyeshadow. And also have the eyeliner I made, which was super easy. One of the easiest things to make and one of the hardest. And uh, now I can put them on and finally live my dream of being a 2000 emo rock band rock star. And these are the last two pieces of the cosmetics, which 
means you finally put it all together, do the makeover. So I'm gonna go back to Caroline, see what she thinks of it, see what I did right, see what I did probably did mostly wrong, and uh, that'll be our next episode. So check that out. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.